Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for being here and sticking it out until the very end. Um, I know that you've heard a lot about features and I know that you heard about a lot about products and uh, a lot about what Liferay can do. And for me, in the next half an hour, um, I would like to do two things. I would like to inspire you and tell you a couple inspiring stories. And I would like to encourage you wherever you are, be it in business or in the technical field. Um, let's see if my presentation here will start. Um, can we get to the line? Very good. Um, I would like to start with the first question. Uh, who of you remembers his first car, his or first car, when you bought your first car? Do you remember it? Do you have very fond memories of it? Um, not many, probably it was a small little car maybe that you bought. I have very fond memories of my very first car and uh, it looked like this. It was a BMW 315 series. I bought it back then for 800 D marks. This would be 400 euros right now. And uh, I remember when we went for a test drive, I was uh, sitting in the passenger seat and my dad was actually driving it to see if the car was everything in order. My dad knows a lot about cars and he said, it's a good car and we should buy it, but there's something wrong with the clutch, right? So it was not an automatic, it was with the clutch. And uh, he said, we need to fix the clutch. And I was scared right away because I didn't know anything about cars, but my dad knew it. And so at some point, we got a bunch of tools together um, and uh, rented a space where we could go underneath the car and we replaced the clutch. And I was amazed as an 18, 19 year old that uh, how simple it was. My dad explained to me uh, where things were in the engine and everything else. And uh, starting from then, I did a lot of things myself with that car. Now, I would not be able and confident to do it with cars that are built today, right? It got more complex, it got more sophisticated, there's much more electronics in it. And so uh, I think this is a good picture of the time that we're finding ourselves right now, right? Our analog and our digital world has been increasingly growing to be more and more complex in the last 20 years. Let me give you some examples. Um, I think you might uh, be aware of the statistic, population with internet access, just 20 years ago, it was only 3.6% of the world that had internet access. Now it's more than 54%, right? And um, I'm not sure if you remember this sound. Uh, let's see, can you turn it up? Who of you remembers this sound? Oh man, we are old in this, right? And remember this, you had to log in through a modem. You had to log in through a modem, the sound came and nobody could call you and you had this really slow but very satisfactory uh, connection with the internet. Now, ha things have changed. Um, we had 500 million devices back then. Now we have over 8 billion devices connected to the internet. And uh, I think what, when we, when we look at it and when you think about it uh, through the past, it, here are the things that have changed from mobile phones that were really big and clunky. We are now to smartphones. Uh, from a client server, we moved to the cloud or software as a service. And uh, from video conferences, now we have FaceTime and Skype. What has stayed the same for 20 years is email. And probably as you're sitting right now here, your inbox is filling up and you're wondering how you're gonna deal with that. It has never changed, right? The email was back then, uh, probably not as much, but now it's still in use. And what we can say in, in these 20 years of digital transformation, and I have done some research about it, and I've, I've tried to find out when was the term first time used, the term that we use at conferences, over and over again, the term that is used to describe this era where we have a lot of digitalization, where we have a lot of things that are groundbreaking in the terms of computers, AI, machine learning. And um, the first time it was used by a consultant from Capgemini, um, in, together with research from uh, a university in the United States called MIT, and it actually was first digital business, and then it became digital transformation. And for 20 years we've been talking about this and uh, I believe actually the talk after me uh, from a professor, he will talk specifically about the dynamics of digital transformation, how we can bring it further and there are different steps that one has to take as an organization or as an enterprise. But in my view, uh, even as we are talking about it for a long time, there's a lot of digital 
but there's not a lot of transformation. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of things that make it possible to bring your enterprise to the next level. But still, the transformation that has to happen in our companies and our organizations is very slow. And I would like to talk about our specific, our specific action points or the things that we can do in the age of digital transformation to bring our companies to the next level. And I've shown this slide last year, maybe if you were around last year at the symposium, and this has not changed, right? These things, we are all digital leaders, and we need to coordinate and manage change. We need to make progress very quickly, right? We need to integrate digital into all aspects, otherwise it is not digital transformation. We, we need to work closely with other decision makers. We need to bring bold vision and navigate complex organizational structures. And it doesn't matter if you're in IT, as Brian mentioned earlier this morning, or if you're in business, these are the things that we're tasked with. And this is how success or failure is measured. And in this context, I would like to talk to you about things that can be summarized in making it right and please delight. It's a play in words in English, but basically it all can be summarized if the customer, if our partner, if our employees are at the center, then it, it's only about these two things. Let's make the system right. Let's um, make the customer service right. Let's make the prospect generation right. And then once we have gained a customer, once we have gained a partner, once the employee is on board, we need to delight them with our systems, with our services, with our equipment. And in this, I would like to talk to you about two things. I believe two things are very important. One thing is context and awareness, that we are aware about what's going on around us. Right? And uh, wh what are the trends? What are the feelings of the people? Uh, what is the customer looking for next? And then, of course, we need to look at the skills and the tools that are necessary to build something like this. So I have three points. One is, is engage your team. Right? I think that's very, very important. And when we start, when we look at the human capital in our organizations, and everybody probably of you would, would say, yes, human capital, the people who work at my organization, at my office, at my enterprise, this is the most valued resource out there. Um, I brought you a statistic from Germany, I'm not sure how it is in Spain, but there's been um, a very regular index measured in Germany, and uh, it shows that only 15 people out of 100, 15% of German employees are emotionally engaged with their job. Right? Then we have about 70 persons, this is the big chunk of them, that are indifferent, right? And then there's no emotional engagement of 15%. I showed the slide at a conference just last month. And after the conference, uh, two people came up to me and they said, uh, Mr. Duke, we really liked your slide that you showed. And we right away, we did um, like a comparison to our organization. How many people are emotionally engaged and how many are not? And they showed me a list of names, right? And then they showed me, and it's about right, they said, about two people from our team, they're not engaged. And I said, what are you going to do about it? And they said, well, we're probably going to let them go. <laughs> Please don't let anybody go after seeing the slide. Okay? Um, but I think what is really important to realize that people who are engaged with your company, emotionally engaged, wh who give everything, who stay longer hours, who really believe in the product or the service or the brand that you have, um, that they deserve really good tools. And nowadays, there's a gap, there's a gap of what we see and what we experience, right? The CEO of Tesco, he puts it like this, in my experience, the employees, people who work for our companies, people who work in organizations, we ourselves, we just want four things, right? We want an interesting role, we want to be taken seriously, we want to have a chance to get ahead, and we want to have a boss who helps. But also when we look at the things that we have in our personal life right now, um, and this is another gap that we see nowadays in organizations, um, we are used to Google, we are used to Facebook, we are used to Instagram, we're used to these experiences that are totally tailored to the customer, right? And then we log in to our company intranet, right? We log in and to our service system. We log in somewhere else, and some people still nowadays have to log in multiple times a day. And if you don't have single sign-on, please come to speak to our, one of our consultants today, right? It can be remedied. It can be fixed. 
But I think the problem is that we don't realize the context around us is that people who are starting in our workplaces now, right, digital natives, millennials, they expect the same kind of tools at the workplace that they have in their private life. I'll give you one example. Um, one of my sons, he has a allergy. And the allergy comes uh, very strong in the spring. And um, at some point we said, we gotta order a little purifier, a little air purifier for his room. And so when the package arrived, this is how it looked like. Um, and right away when we unpackaged it, my son, he's 14 years old, he has a smartphone. And right away he was looking if there's an app for this purifier. My other son, who's only 10 years old, he doesn't have a smartphone, but it doesn't matter to him. He started speaking to this thing and he was saying, Alexa, right? This is what the people are growing up with and in 10 years, they will be your future apprenticeship people, the people who will be sitting in your banks, in your organizations, in your insurance company, in your government organization. And they are used to these kinds of tools. They're used to voice command. They're, they're gonna be living in a totally different environment. And I think it, um, it's important for us to realize, especially in more established services or companies, that these are the people, this is something that they expect. Now, this is how what I call engage your team. Of course, we also need to build for these people. I would like to introduce you to um, Dante Ragazzo. Dante Ragazzo is uh, one of the IT managers at a company called Coach. Coach is a luxury brand, you might know it. Um, it is based in New York City, and they produce bags and luxury equipment um, for uh, people who like that kind of stuff, right? And um, he, they use LifeRay, and what happened with Coach is they, they installed it at, at first for the intranet. They built for the team, they built for the people, and here's what happened. They, in, since they went online with the intranet, they saved about $500,000 in postage alone. Why? Because they used to, whenever they had new products in the store, they used to print out the store layout, right? How, which bag is positioned where, and then they used to mail it to all the stores, and then the people had to go around the store with a printout and then position the bags, and then they didn't know if it was right or not. Now, they all do that online with a mobile phone, with a tablet, they walk through the stores, they send them the new layout, and the people can take pictures, send it back to the supervisor, and the supervisor says, yes, well done, or this has to be still adjusted. And um, don't say right, so I, I met him um, one year ago in London, and was speaking to him. He says, you know, for me, it's very, very funny. There's this dynamic between IT and business. Business wants to jump ahead and uh, says, we need this and this and this. And I've seen this in this uh, presentation or in this online or in this commercial. And then IT says, yes, but. Have you ever said that to your business? Yes, but, right? Um, and I think it is important, just as Brian pointed out today, that the both parties work well together. And this is here in this case, he said, let's try it with this ecosystem. Let's set a cornerstone with LifeRay and continue building from there. They're very, very satisfied as we speak right now. Another gentleman that I would like to introduce you to is Jörg Duhr. Uh, he works for a company called Schott and they produce different kinds of glass products, right? From Ceran stoves that you probably have in your house for a cooking stove uh, to glass for cars and other equipment. And they wanted to foster innovation. And what they did, they, they brought up a forum. They built up an internet with a forum. And people were not used to it uh, back then. And so he said, let me just try something. And he put in a new idea for a new product in the area of glass. And other people on the other side of the world, they, they saw this post and they said, hey, wow, this is an interesting idea. They collaborated. And in a matter of six months, just because somebody put something in a forum, they had it up in, in a scale where they could file a patent for this product. And this innovation would have not happened if the people would have not looked at the context, we need a forum, and built for the team. Now, the second point I would like to make is we need to be invested in our customers if we wanna take our brand forward. Digital transformation and disruption, the companies that are very successful at doing that, um, we see a pattern there, and the pattern is they do or build systems um, and they look at the customer and they work very, very specific for that purpose. It's customer-centric actions that define the success or failure of a company nowadays. If we put the customer into the center and if we ask him, what do you want? What do we, 
uh, what does she want, right? And we put that into our minds, and then not only do we listen to them, but we put that into action. That's where the success lies. Um, I read this quote recently in a magazine, and it struck to me that the person was saying, we got rid of every vendor, and we're not collaborating with anybody else who is not invested into the success of our brand, who is not completely invested into the success of our brand. And my question to you is, are you invested into the success of your customer? Let me introduce you to Radoslav Volny. Radoslav Volny is the online transformation manager for a big telco company in Slovakia, O2. And uh, they came into the market um, 10 years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, as a third, as a challenger, because there were two big telcos established there. And they said, here are the three things that we want our customers and our employees to have as, as really experience it. Number one, it needs to be fair, right? Our prices need to be fair. Our uh, monthly plans need to be fair. Then we want to have fans of our employees and also from our customers. And it also needs to be fun. And what they did is um, I interviewed him, and this is mind-blowing to me, right? In a matter uh, of a couple years, they grew from 300,000 customers to almost 2 million customers. They started with a simple landing page, and then they upgraded it. They built a CRM, and uh, it was interesting. We were at a store, and this, was, this is my next point, right? I've seen how they built step-by-step step an experience for the customer that mattered to them. I interviewed one of the clerks who works at the store, and he said, actually, you know, I feel really, really bad when my customers come and ask me a question about their bill, about their plan, about the cancellation, maybe they want to change the address, because he says, here, look, let me show you the computer, and you can do this at home by yourself. I actually don't need me for this, right? And he shows them how to do this, and the people are amazed. They say, oh, wow, I didn't know about the system. And the goal is for the people with these little requests not to go to the store. So the clerks and the people who sell the plants and the phones, et cetera, have more time for the other customers. And this is happening right now. And what amazed me there is that everything was geared towards a good customer experience. Right? I looked around the store. There were different products laid out. There's, uh, the people can sit down with you and, and do the contract right away on their mobile on a tablet. And then I walked over here, and I was like, what is this, right? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't understand it at first. There's, there's a screen and black and white, and then I put these glasses on. And this is not something that's really appealing to me. But then I imagined my children going shopping there. The younger generation, right? Right now, that, that is uh, totally hooked to the mobile. And this might be really important to them. This is something that comes intuitively to them. They will pick up the glasses. They will have an experience at the store and then ultimately become a customer, a follower, a fan of that brand. Now, I think the third point is to be fanatical about improvements. Um, what I notice whenever I talk to customers, whenever I talk and read about good brands, is they don't settle for the status quo. I think when we look at a good customer experience, it's very, very simple. Uh, this is what one, what one of the analyst houses says about a good customer experience. It actually has only three things that are important, right? The experience or the product, uh, the service needs to be effective. It needs to be easy to use. And then it needs to elicit or empower me to a positive emotion. Now, when we think about these three things, then we say, well, it's actually not that difficult to make these things happen. And when we look at the statistics, 21% of the marketing budget today goes towards technology. And yet, marketing people and business people, 41% of them say, we have a lack of technology in that area. And um, I'm not sure if it is a lack of technology. I would leave that up to you. But um, what I learned from this gentleman, he lives in Stuttgart. Um, he's a part of the Bosch Group, smart home product for the Bosch Group. And I, I went to visit him, and I asked him, how do you do things? What is, your, what is your product? And what they built is little cameras, right, um, or a thermostat for your heating system. And everything is automated, can be right away dialed in and uh, serviced from your app. And I talked to him, and I said, you know, how important is customer centricity to you? How important is it to, to go the next step for your customer? 
and here's what he replied. He says, for us, everything starts and ends with customer centricity. Everything, right? And um, th they, uh, and, and, and I was amazed at this and said, well, uh, how do you sell your product, right? Um, he says, well, we have this uh, beautiful site. We enabled uh, them to build a multi-language site uh, with a nice uh, interface. And then he said, you know, when we started with it, we had a very, very clear vision. Um, and then he brought me to this room. This is not his office. Um, this is a, sort of like a creative room. And what you see here on the left, right, or on, on your left or my right, um, is a very long wall. And this is the entire customer journey of a customer who finds this Bosch Smart Home product either at a store or on eBay or on Amazon um, or on their website and then goes through the entire fulfillment back to customer service. And uh, I said, well, you devised this. He says, yeah, this is just for our website, right? And I said, how much time do you spend it? He said, I'm not gonna tell you the time, but we spent a significant amount of time thinking about the customer journey. Um, we made little improvements on the way. Um, and here's the thing, and I asked him, well, how much do you make through your website? And he said, it's only 5%. 5% of our revenue we sell through our website. And this is when it dawned on me. He said, even though we make only 5% of our revenue through our website, for us, the customer journey is very, very important. and We build for our customers. Now, I, I think when we build for our customers, here's the dynamic that I want to leave you with or uh, uh, introduce to you, right? There's moments of truth that we have with the brand, and then there's moments of connection that happen. Moments of truth are when you bring a new device home, maybe it could be an appliance or a new washing machine, right? And then um, you find out it washes better or worse and that the last washing machine you had, or you buy a new phone and then you realize when, when it falls down, uh, does it really hold up to the specs and standards or does it break, right? Or does it shut down all the time? So with every product, with every service that we have, we have moments of truth, right? And they either reinforce the positive connection with the brand or they put us a little bit at a more distance from the brand. And then, beyond the moments of truth, we have moments of connection. And I'm gonna bring you one example. I travel a lot for my work, right? I'm on the road significantly throughout the year, and I have this very special moment when after a business trip or after a series of meetings, I come home and I walk through the airport, right? And hopefully the sun is shining like in this picture, and I look forward to connecting with my friends and by the, my family, et cetera. And, um, one time, I was in London on a business trip, and uh, I got a notification that my flight might not be happening because of a strike of the airline that I'm using. And here, in full disclosure, this is the airline that I'm using. It's a German airline with an orange logo, right? And so what I did, I cut the meeting short, and I drove to the airport, and I walked up to the first, you know, first class business counter. I just walked up to the lady, and I said, you know, I heard there might be a strike going on. I know there's a flight still going in half an hour. Could you still put me on that flight? Now, my ticket was not transferable. It was also non-refundable. The lady looked in her system. Um, she smiled at me and she printed out the boarding pass and she said, please hurry to the gate, the flight is leaving very soon. And in that moment, it was not just a moment of truth where I found out if the service is good or bad of the certain company or brand, right? It was a moment of connection. Now, I don't have only positive experiences with this German brand, right? But what is true is that at some point, they made a moment of connection with me. And that made all the difference. And now I'm asking you, when you look at your systems, when you look at your business meetings, when you think about the digital transformation projects that you have in your organization, in your company, does it make moments of connection possible and are they positive? Here's what I want to leave you with. It's just a summary of the three points. I believe if you want to like to take your company, your organization to the next level, you need to engage your team and build for them. I convinced that you need to be invested in your customer and take it step by step. And you need to be fanatical about improvements and start with a clear vision. Uh, recently, I went on a tour uh, of a BMW factory, and this is where I actually took a photo of my first car, right? And uh, I learned something that day, and this is something I want to leave you with. I learned something that every BMW since the 1960s has a certain feature, right? 
And this feature is uh, being put back to a German designer. It's uh, uh, Mr. Hofmann, and it has a name. There's in the C column, the, the, the window, it, it, it doesn't go completely back, but it curves back, right? And it, it shows you a little bit of dynamic in the car. And uh, every BMW model has this, right, throughout the years. And there's actually a name for it. It's called the Hofmeister Kink, you know, kink for being round. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which model it is, it has sometimes, or most of the times, all the time, it has this kink. And I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, when Mr. Hofmeister designed this one car in the 60s, right, was he trying to make something for generations to come? I don't think so. I think he was sat down and he said, how can we make this next model beautiful? How can we make it more efficient? How can we make it more efficient in style? Right? And uh, this is what I want to submit to you as well. In your project right now, right? What will your legacy be? Maybe it is just something small, but you invent something that will impact generations in your company to come. And this is what uh, my part of encouragement is to you. Um, life is short, do something significant. If we can help you as Lifeway, we're really, really happy to provide the tools and the skills and the consulting for you if you need it. And otherwise, go and do something great. Thank you.